Hi, this is Bob Weiss. I'm the host of Shaking Your World. Cheers. One. Folks, welcome home. Yet another episode of Shaking Your World here at the lovely Shakers in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It is an astoundingly beautiful day today and the day before the autumnal equinox. So it is the 21st of September. Man, it is gorgeous. Today we have with us Hector Colon. Hector Colon has a storied past, a really remarkable cat who's come up from, well, Milwaukee, mm -hmm. um, through the Golden Gloves, through uh, the Olympics, through any number of things, mm -hmm. yeah. cusp of the Olympics, perhaps. Yes. And then uh, to being a man that has made significant changes and a difference in people's lives on a daily basis through different social service organizations. Hector, welcome. It's very good to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And, Thank uh, you for cheers. having me. Cheers. Let's have a, cheers. a Thank little you. fun for the next hour. So. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. So, Hector, you, um, you know, I touched on, of course, just briefly, the Golden Gloves. So you, you began as a boxer at some point. Mm -hmm. How did that evolve? Yeah, so when I was nine years old, um, lived on near south side of Milwaukee. And at the time, when I was very young, we were one of three Latino families mm -hmm. on the block. And there was an individual family that really didn't want us there. And one of the kids, I went to play baseball with them on an early morning. Uh, and he said, look. We don't want you here. You speak, you N-word, get out of our neighborhood. Then he quickly hit me in the face and came home with a bloody nose. And as I went up, uh, I saw my father and he said, what happened? Get the paso. And I told him, he said, you know, I'm going to take you to the gym so you can learn how to defend yourself. And uh, you need to hit him back. So the next time he won't, he won't do that. Mm -hmm. So that's really where it all started. And I did go to United Community Center. Mm -hmm. Uh, UCC and uh, Shorty Israel Acosta, mm -hmm. who's uh, he's a giant. Uh, we call him Shorty. Yep. He's a giant in this community. He told my father uh, after putting me uh, in front of the mirror and started showing me some boxing combinations. Mm -hmm. He said, "Your son's a natural. He's going to become a champion," and he was right. I ended up uh, becoming um, a seven-time national champion. Oh my. And in 1992, I was favored to go to the Olympics as a welterweight. Mm -hmm. And so here I am, the most important opportunity in my life. I get in the ring uh, and I lost. Mm. And there's still that little pinch in the heart, even this to this day, not so much that I lost, but because the biggest opportunity in my life that I wasn't focused, mind, body, and spirit. I was 19 years old at the time. So a couple things, I was already looking at the gold medal and looking at the millions I was gonna make afterwards. So I was already looking beyond and a little distracted too, uh, just um, um, some friendships and relationships I was in that uh, didn't allow me to really be focused and, and uh, that hurt. Uh, then I was searching um, and I uh, found God on December 27, 1992. I bought my first Bible and gave my life to Christ, and my life has never been the same ever since. Six months later, I fight the same guy that beat me in the Olympic trials. This time, I knock him out in the first round for the U.S. Championship. So after that fight, I uh, the promoter started coming back. I was on that was on cable television. I was on the inside cover of Sports Illustrated, a front cover of USA Boxing Magazine. Um, but I put it up through a year of prayer and discernment and ended up feeling a strong calling away from the sport. Hardest decision I ever made in my life because something I worked so hard for uh, was literally at the tip of my finger. Uh, I beat um, Vernon Forrest twice, who ended up becoming a four-time world mm -hmm. champion, multimillionaire. I beat uh, Jose Antonio Rivera, who became a three-time uh, world champion. I, not, I beat him by technical knockout. Uh, and I was in the midst of greats. Um, so, uh, but I gave it up. And, uh, but I learned so much in boxing. Uh, that same dedication, determination, and discipline it took to be a champion boxer is the same dedication, determination, and discipline I apply into my life and striving for excellence in everything that I do whether it be as a husband, as a father, or as a CEO. I'm working, I'm working hard to, to reach my potential. What a great story. You, and I've got to say that we're just beginning this process, but I would have to say that you are one of the most humble people <laughs> that I have met. 
Um, and I've, I've met my share of people, and including um, professional fighters before, that mm. um, don't have what you got going on, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank so you. congratulations for you on that. Now, um, social services, you worked in Milwaukee County at one point. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Oh, Milwaukee County was a great experience. Uh, very hard, though. Very hard, the politics, um, just, you know, the complexity of the system. Well, you worked under Chris Abley, right? Worked under Chris Abley, okay. and I love Chris Abley. We're okay. really good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to his wedding uh, just, just recently. Um, but we were there to transform health and human right. services. And we turned multi-million dollar deficits into multi-million dollar surpluses. Uh, serving more people with better, better dignity and more quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would recommend anybody that wants to get into a leadership role to work in a position like that because you just have, you have to, you know, take into consideration the significant financial challenges mm -hmm. that you're faced with. You have, you know, just uh, a lot of advocates that that, that um, want you to do certain things. You gotta be able to know how to work with them in collaboration and develop good um, communication skills. Um, you know, just uh, the politics behind it. So it's just a lot of things that you have to deal with. And I believe I grew in humility uh, and in leadership uh, the six years that I was there. And um, I'm very proud of the work that, that we did while I was there. My team was absolutely incredible. Uh, in fact, I I brought two of them with me at LSS. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, what did that organization do? Yeah, so at, at Milwaukee County, uh, we had we we ran a psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. um, for individuals with severe persistent mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, we also ran a long-term care institution that I closed while I was there. We mm -hmm. closed while I was there because it was really robbing people of their dignity. Okay it actually wasn't in accordance with the law. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a federal homestead law that basically says that you deserve to live in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, in fact, we got sued many times or prior to when I was there uh, for institutionalizing somebody that should have been in a least restrictive setting. But the closure of the long-term care is one of the things I'm most proud of okay. in my entire life. It's also one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm because to stand up and do the right thing sure. was really hard because you had some unions and some individuals that didn't like it because maybe they're gonna lose their jobs or politics got in, into play. Uh, it, so it was really hard, but, mm -hmm. but we ran a long-term, again, we closed that. We had housing programs. Uh, we had programs for persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, um, programs for kids that penetrate the criminal justice system. Okay. So in every one of those divisions mm -hmm. that oversee major transformation for the positive, done, done more efficiently with better outcomes and with more dignity. Um, and it was really hard, but anything that's hard uh, is worth it. Right. Um, and I, that's why I loved it. So um, pesky little fly we've got here. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Uh, obviously, you're, the discipline that you acquired through boxing, mm -hmm. and how long were you in boxing? So from the time I was nine years old mm -hmm. until I was pretty much 20, 20 21. Okay. Yep. So not even at my prime. Okay. Um, but yeah, right around that age. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, but that had to be seven days a week, oh, right? Morning, six, seven noon days. And night. Yep. Okay. Morning, noon, and night. Very intense training. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, eat right, you, you, you got to rest mm -hmm. well, and, and if you're not focused, mind, body, right. and spirit, right. you're not going to be number one. Right. Stay away from women. Yes, yes, you know, yes, okay, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> the focus aspect. Yeah, yes, you yes. Know. So that's, had, that's helped you in everything that you've done. So uh, obviously from Milwaukee County Social Services, then you have leapfrogged into Lutheran Social yep. Services for the upper part of the Midwest, right? Yep. Okay. What's that about? Yeah, so first let me tell you the transition. So when I was at the county, mm -hmm. uh, the county board was threatening not to confirm me because they were really upset with my boss, Chris Abley. Mm -hmm. um, I received uh, a $50,000 raise mm -hmm. increase. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Abley did it because of results. Mm -hmm. 
He did it because of the market dictated that that's what I should sure. have gotten. Right. And he wanted to retain me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when that happened, the county board lost uh, their pension mm. and 50% reduction in pay. So they lumped this all in. It kind of happened at the same time. And, and Chris Abley didn't pass that law, but he supported the law that was ultimately passed at the state legislature. Sure. So all that got lumped in together and they were like, they, they would tell me behind the scenes, this is the only way we can get back to Chris Sabley by not confirming you. And I would say, I'm the angel you know versus the devil you may get. And you know the results, you know the passion, you know what we've done. I'm sorry, Hector, this is politics. So it was a really tough, it was really tough. I, in fact, I, I, it affected my health a little bit, um, but I was overwhelmed with support. This whole campaign called Stand With Hector campaign emerged and Democrats and Republicans and business and labor and um, just every all communities came forth, you know, to support me and started making calls on the county board. And and uh, so long story short, I ended up getting confirmed. Um, so the county board did the right thing. Uh, I did get confirmed. And immediately, a few weeks later, I get a call from the from the board chair from LSS, and he says, "Hey, Hector, uh, everywhere I turn, people say I need to speak with you. I got this president and CEO position. Would you like to have a glass of wine and, and have a discussion?" Uh, it's supposed to be an hour. We had a two-hour discussion, and uh, he tells me now that he went to a home home to his wife, and uh, his wife was a little upset because he was supposed to be there in an hour. But uh, he says, if this were my company, I would hire Hector on the spot. But unfortunately, it wasn't his company. And we went through a six-month process to eventually get the job. Sure. But uh, multiple interviews mm -hmm. and psychometric testing and meeting with a psychologist mm -hmm. and all of those things. And, uh, and I got the job. And, and in hindsight, I'm glad we went. So I, I thought it was a little long. Uh, but in hindsight, I think it was good because we we both got to feel that this was a, a great right. fit right. for me as well as for them. And it's a big deal because I'm the first non-Lutheran, non-pastor, non-Norwegian to run the organization in 138 years. So we had to make sure this was the right decision. And I think all parties feel very blessed that, that uh, things are going very well. Well, well, congratulations on that. Perhaps they're yeah. even in a better position because you are not those other things yeah. and you're not then biased by what yeah. needs to take place and you right. can bring this other perspective in. Yeah. I find that's often the key for many things that are successful is that you look outside the box yeah. to find a better way inside the box. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. What's next? Well, I love to uh, love LSS. I've mm -hmm. uh, been there for three years now. Mm -hmm. We've gone through a major transformation since I've been there. Okay. Uh, in the 10 years before I was there, we only met two budgets. And during that period of time, we lost $10 million. Uh, my first budget, we budgeted at a $500,000 loss, which is a big turnaround coming from $2 million loss that prior year. Oh, yeah. We came in 67000 positive. Okay. My second budget, we budgeted at a break even. We came at 2.5 million positive. And my third budget, um, we budgeted at a $850,000 gain. That's this year. The pandemic hit us. Yeah. Where we, where we hit by up to a million dollars of revenue per month as a result of that pandemic. I am surrounded with an incredible team and board. We, we adapted, we innovated, and we collaborated. And as a result of all those changes that we made, we will not only meet, but exceed our budget this year. Talk about meeting the, uh, the Lord's work head on. This is fantastic for yes, you. The yes. dragon slayer that you are, it's great. Yes, yes. Very, very huh. exciting. Very wonderful. I'm so happy to be part of LSS, which is, they've been around 138 years. Okay. So they have a history of credibility of a great reputation, mm -hmm. of delivering quality results. Uh, so I'm so honored and humbled to be, um, to succeed many great individuals uh, that were before me that allows me the opportunity to serve in this wonderful organization. Indeed, well, a staff is crucial for every operation mm -hmm. and having the right people, but that all begins at the top. Yeah. So obviously you're able to get things to work together in the right Thank direction. You. And that's, again, kudos to you. Thank you. So um, what part of that 
uh, position, well, maybe not the position per se, but the job entails working with kids. Because mm. I'm really concerned about kids that are at risk and yep. moving in the right direction. Yeah, probably a little over a third okay. of, of what we do okay. relates to children, uh, children with disabilities, uh, foster care, special needs adoption, um, mental health. Uh, we, we serve about over 30,000 of individuals on a yearly basis. And again, about a third of those are children specifically. So we do a lot for children and it's so important. Um, the children are our future. Uh, many of the kids that we serve um, have very tough backgrounds right. um, and trauma. And so it's important to address them from a trauma-informed perspective right. and unleash the greatness out of them. Um, even though they might have some tough situations and, and intergenerational poverty, and, uh, but, but, but we can, they have potential. And it's our jobs to get that out of them and empower them right. uh, to be excellent uh, citizens in our society. And that's what uh, my team does each and every day. You know, last year we served um, over 30,000 individuals and 91% of them indicated that we improved their quality of life. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Uh, basically, 500,000 people in the city of Milwaukee, right? And you're impacting 30,000 people. That's significant. Yeah, and this is, uh, so we're in Wisconsin and okay. Upper Michigan. So okay. not just Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, we do serve Milwaukee, but this is the whole state. Uh, we're, we're pretty much in 62 counties of the 72 uh, in Wisconsin. Well, even then of the 5 million people that perhaps are in the district, that's yes. fantastic. Yes. So what percentage of those kids are you moving towards a gym or a boxing situation? Yeah. Boxing, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't necessarily do that, okay. but, but if any, if I speak to kids, mm -hmm. I'll share my story. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's interested personally, I'll, I'll tell them what it takes, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll steer them in that direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's not something we like proactively do. Sure. Uh, but in fact, you know, not too long ago, well, maybe a couple years ago, I went to our residential treatment facility for the kids that... Uh, penetrate the criminal justice system okay. in uh, Wittenberg, Wisconsin. Okay. And I spoke with those kids there. I shared with them a little bit of my, about my story. And I remember um, I kind of broke down in, in tears as mm. I was speaking with them because um, they were just incredible kids. And um, when I asked them why they were here, sure. I was expecting, because I know some of the stories, right. Uh, burglary and robbery or right. I was selling drugs and I didn't hear any of that. I heard that I'm here because I want to get better. I'm here because the staff care for me and um, I'm here so that I can go back to school. Just some really, the way they phrased it was really positive. And then before that, I was playing baseball with them and I saw teamwork. I saw respect. I didn't hear not one swear word. I saw you know, really uh, encouraging one another. And I, I shared with them, uh, when I spoke with them, I told them a little bit about my own background. And, uh, and I, I said, with, you know, my own struggles. You know, I have, uh, you know, my, my, my mother and father got a divorce when I was 12. Mm. My mother was working two and three jobs uh, to support the family. She has a seventh grade education. She had a rough upbringing. My sister was addicted to drugs. She had mental mm. illness. Uh, my best friends were dying of drug overdose. My mm. cousins were dying of gang violence. And I was 12 years old just trying to figure it out. So I shared yeah. that with them. As a result of those factors, I have, I would have, my A score is a six. A stands for adverse early childhood trauma effects. Okay. Uh, an A score of six would indicate that I would have a 1,200% likelihood of having depression and a 200% likelihood of committing suicide. Ugh. So I shared that with them to let them know that, um, you know, even though you might have some challenges, work hard and you can overcome those challenges. Mm -hmm. You can be something great, uh, but, but be dedicated, mm -hmm. determined, and disciplined and put the work into it. So I share those stories whenever I can talk to kids. I'd sure. love to, um, you know, relate to them and get to their level and inspire them to be something great in life. Great story. Yeah. It's crucial. It's everything. 
So um, I presume that you work with like Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation along some things? Actually, yes. I was Wendy in a, on a and, call with Wendy not too okay. long ago, just about maybe a month ago, just okay. to see how we can collaborate sure. and, and some of our clients have mm -hmm. access to uh, her programs mm -hmm. to elevate them and become yep. business owners. Yes. Neat stuff. Uh, yes. Anything with uh, Antonio Perez? Oh, I just uh, emailed him today, or he emailed me. He mails me these different articles, and absolutely, we are we have good collaboration with them. So we provide supportive services mm -hmm. to a lot of his housing unit mm -hmm. individuals within his housing unit. Sure, those that have mental health needs or those that just need a little support mm -hmm. to continue to live in their place independently and successfully. So yes, uh, Tony's a, a friend, and uh, we have a collaboration with him. Solid well. people, good oh, solid people. Yes. yes. Um, Antonio Riley? Uh -huh. Antonio Riley is a good friend. So I worked for Antonio Riley. I used okay. to be the director for uh, economic development at WIDA. Okay. And Antonio Riley is a great friend. Mm -hmm. um, we keep in contact. I haven't seen him, though, uh, for probably about a couple years. But okay. we, I did communicate with him not too long ago, maybe just about six months ago. Mm -hmm. But good people. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Well, like anything else in life, when you surround yourself with better people, yeah. You interact with better people, the results are positive, yes. right? And I think there's a great message for people because so often you've got people that are just chatting your ear, and especially in, in this year, that people yeah. just want to bring things down mm -hmm. and look at the negative side mm -hmm. of things. But I'm all yeah. about finding the opportunity for something. And I think much of that depends upon having the right people that can bring a positive spin to something. Right. Even in the darkest points or days, you can find That's something right. positive, and you have to find that message to carry forth to take people and to help them to get somewhere else too. I love that message. You know, it's a very important message right now. Uh, just look at our political environment. Um, it's so polarizing. Mm -hmm. It's so divisive and it's filled with hate. And, and um, you know, I, I think neither of the parties should compromise their values or their positions. I mean, that's who they are, but they allow these polarizing policy issues to divide us instead of look for ways where there's common ground. And I would argue that the overwhelming majority of big issues, education, you know, jobs, uh, health and well-being, that's all in the middle here that we can solve this. We can solve this if we put all those things aside. Um, and so I believe, so I just wrote a book, uh, My Journey from Boxing Ring to Boardroom. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, five virtues for life and leadership. Okay. And the five virtues are magnanimity, mm -hmm. which is striving for greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, humility at its core and in mm -hmm. context of my book is about serving others. Um, courage, which is about facing your fears and fighting to do the right thing. Uh, and perseverance, which is about not giving up. And actually going out there and be willing to fail as long as you learn from those failures, mm -hmm. you can become something great. And the last one is temperance, and that's about self-control and restraint. We need these virtues more than ever in our political environment. Uh, if we did, uh, we'd fight to do the right thing, man. And, and we wouldn't compromise our values. We shouldn't. And again, all things that you probably learned early on in boxing, because those are all essential oh, to what you're doing. Absolutely. So those virtues I learned in boxing, uh -huh. magnanimity, you, you're trying to be the champion. Yep. Nothing but yep. the champion is, is, is good enough. Humility, you know, I, I learned what it meant to be served by my coach. So he loved me. Um, he took me into his house where he fed me. Mm -hmm. um, he spent his weekends with me, his, his nights with me. So he served me. I mm -hmm. learned what, what that service did to me in right. helping create the champion that I am. Right. And now in my profession, I love the servant-led approach where I can serve others and bring mm -hmm. out the, the greatness in them. Courage, man. If you're, when you're in boxing, I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. You're scared when mm -hmm. you go into that ring. Mike Tyson, the, the best, uh, Floyd Mayweather, anybody who has boxed mm -hmm. will tell you, I went into that ring scared. Mm -hmm. But they go into that ring scared with courage mm -hmm. because they're prepared. Right. Same thing in life. Uh, you know, if, if you have no fear, you have no courage. Mm -hmm. Perseverance. Man, I, I failed in boxing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't make the, the final Olympics. 
Uh, I lost my first two fights. If I would have given up, I would have never been able to travel the world and uh, and have learn all these virtues right. and and get the worldwide perspective I have because of going to Poland and seeing the Polish people, the, the great people they were versus this Polish guy that was calling me a spick and an N-word. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to see Russia. I got to experience real poverty mm -hmm. in Barbados. I thought I was poor, and we were, but I saw real poverty. Abject poverty, yeah. So perseverance is so important. And then temperance, you know, in boxing, it ain't a fight. If you get hit, you know, you gotta compose yourself and not fight back, but compose yourself and say, okay, what just happened? And how do I, how do I make sure this doesn't happen again? And I can't get mad, I'm just, this is the fight, this is the game. Or if you get hit with a low blow and the referee doesn't catch it, you don't hit the guy back with a low blow because now you can get disqualified. So you learn temperance. Mm -hmm. So it, right before the fight, you know, there's some, some um, you know, bad talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't let that get to your mind. You got to mm -hmm. be composed and calm mm -hmm. and it's okay. You know, just let's, I'm thinking, wait till I get you in the ring and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so you learn temperance in mm -hmm. boxing, but we need more temperance in the world. Um, you know, just maybe pause before you react to a situation. Pause before you actually maybe retaliate with, with those words. You know, just think, could you say it a different way that will lead to a better outcome? We need more of that in politics. Couldn't agree more. And this is a, a constant refrain here is that I, I am always saying that we need to have states but not politicians. And I think we really haven't had dedicated statesmen since probably John Adams. It's been that long because people have their own bias and reasons to be in office. Yeah. But we have to find a way for people to reach across that aisle and bring this thing together. Yeah. City, state, federally, you have to find a way to get people to function as a country again. Yeah. And yes, maintain your ideals, whatever they might be, but find a way to function. And it just seems that we can't do that. And maybe part of that is a two-party system we have going on. Yeah. Um, but in either regard, it must change. Obviously, it can't for this cycle, but maybe the next cycle things can start to move in a different direction. Mm -hmm. For our kids' sake, we have to find a better way because yeah. all this is going to do is rip this further apart. Mm -hmm. And the animus that's out there is, is absolutely bizarre to me right. uh, how we can't. Just think back to 2001, how the country came together, right? Mm -hmm. And we are just so far apart in 20 years. It's, right. it's just nuts. That's right. Yeah. And the big thing here is that education. I'm always pushing education mm -hmm. and jobs. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm frequently attacking Tom Barrett because, you know, you put together the streetcar that the money could have been spent on something else. In my mind, taking transportation, moving people from where they, are, they live, whether it's the south side or north side, mm -hmm. get them to the jobs. Yep. Menominee Falls, Waukesha, wherever they might be, get them yep. to the jobs. That's people right. have to be able to make money to support their families. Mm -hmm. And that'll alleviate some of the crime situation as well. Yep. Uh, just because they don't have a job, they often qualify for benefits that take care of some of the health care concerns. Mm -hmm. And then they're working. Then, of course, you get the kids educated. So between employment and education, these are the two primary things that we must address. Absolutely. Uh, to lift people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I would just add that that training and education should be structured in a way that it leads to a job. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, even in our technical colleges, um, there are you know lots of certificates and mm -hmm. lots of training that don't lead to a good job mm -hmm. or lead to a job at all. Right. And so how do we make sure that whatever we're doing for the people that we're trying to educate, that mm -hmm. it's gonna lead to something good because that's what really is gonna make the difference. Well, we have a we have a nation of overeducated people with either the bachelors or masters or some doctorates that can't think the way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. And I frequently tell the story about when I was still married a few years ago, and my uh, ex-wife had come to pick me up. We're driving with the kids down to Florida, and we have two principals or MPS that are here, and she interacts with them for a moment, and they inquire if, if we're going to be driving through Texas, and she mm -hmm. said, "No, we're driving yeah. to Florida." Yeah. And, you know, one of these principals like, well, you, you got to go through Texas to get to Florida. And she's like, well, no, Wisconsin's here, Florida's here, Texas is here. We're, no, 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 yeah. you know. So, I mean, even at that point, so you've got a guy who's got his doctorate and he's the principal of a school. He really ought to know basic American sure. geometry sure, or sure, geography, sure, rather, sure. if nothing else. And he can't figure that out. So I think maybe 30 or 40 years ago, we got off the path of really educating for to educate someone to get them to learn how to think. 
-hmm. And instead, we just have this outcome-based education that really doesn't prepare you for anything. Yeah. And you've got kids that are in grade school and middle school and high school that ought to be able to walk out and be literate enough that they can read, that they can write, that they can do simple mathematics and have a comprehension for things, and most importantly, and learn how to get along with other people. That's so important. Right. And that's not taught very much nope. in, in school at all, right? Nope. Uh, it's maybe a little bit of immersion, but you're right. Just those life skills yep. on how to communicate with others uh, and how to have temperance uh, is not really taught in school, but so mm -hmm. important. Also, financial acumen, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, how to make sure that... Balance that checkbook. You balance the checkbook, yeah. get a Pay job, mortgage, save some, money, yeah. <laughs> you know, invest in the right things, right. you know, and, and uh, you know, when you're early in life and in your career, don't start splurging on buying the best things. You mm -hmm. know, that, that, that could come and, should, and will come if you do things the right way, you work hard right. and... And you stay frugal and uh, you invest your money and, and be smart, you know. So we need more of that in our educational system as well. Well, look, in the, when did uh, MTV come on the scene in the 1980s? So now you've got kids exposed to, you know, the crib life mentality. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there's always been this deification with uh, the super sports figures that are making mm -hmm. the ridiculous amounts of money. Yeah. 30 million bucks to play basketball? Right. Well, who doesn't want that, of course, sure, but, sure, but come sure. on. You know, it's just, yes. it's really sports in the day. Mm -hmm. Same thing, not to knock boxing, but the same thing with that. I mean, yep. there have been some significant yeah. awards that have taken place where I think there needs to be an adjustment overall in the system. Mm -hmm. So just because you're on a gridiron and you're, you're knocking somebody yeah. around for four or five months and playing football, yes. doesn't mean you should get that much money. Yes. Yep. And uh, I, I think we need to, maybe maybe COVID will help to adjust some things. Mm -hmm. I think that there will be a tremendous falling out after this season yep. and uh, year is over because advertisers are going to realize that they've lost a lot of the base that's been interacting with this. Yep. And, um, yeah. and there we are. Yes, yes. So what would you like to, uh, to change if you, if you had a, both a crystal ball to look into the future and if you had an unlimited uh, amount of money to do it with, what would you first work yourself with you? Well, I, um, I'm so passionate about health and human services and, and, and increasing the well-being of, of others. And so mental illness and behavioral health is something that's uh, really important, near mm -hmm. and dear to me, you know, considering my, my sister's background. And, and my sister, by the way, is, is doing well. She's stable. Um, since my daughter was born, and that's 17 years, uh, prior to that, she was, you know, in and out and not doing very well. Uh, but, you know, I have a passion for, for behavioral health and, mm -hmm. and, um, and many, ex many people are suffering mm -hmm. and they need support. Um, and we have to be there to support them. Mm -hmm. These aren't individuals that, you know, uh, are innately, you know, don't want to work. Uh, they don't want to contribute, you know, they just have a situation that's um, impacting them a little bit. But now we have to bring out the best out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they can work, mm -hmm. uh, they can um, uh, achieve greatness, uh, they can be incredible leaders, and they are, by mm -hmm. the way. You know, one in four of us have uh, a mental illness, and so they are your neighbors. Uh, they are your doctors. Uh, they are your politicians. They're, we're, they're all out in society today, but there's a stigma uh, relating to mental illness. Mm -hmm. And because of that stigma, there are some that don't want to receive treatment and some that don't want to accept treatment. Um, so I, I, will, I would love to continue to do the work that I'm doing now and continue to raise awareness mm -hmm. and visibility regarding uh, mental illness. Uh, to let people know that, hey, you can receive treatment and, and it's important. Um, you know, you can receive medications and therapy. Uh, and most importantly, try to um, have hobbies and work. You know, when you're a productive member of society, that's going to improve your health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm very passionate about that. Here we are. So a few minutes ago, you're talking about the uh, the kids that you're having a conversation with. I could see you've still got the hand moves. You still got the. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure your yeah. reflexes are still there. Do you ever miss that? You know, um, occasionally from time to time. You know, just uh, the other day, I went to um, Chicago to visit an old friend of mine, Montel Griffin, okay. who was uh, an Olympian. Uh, in 1992, he made the Olympics. 
we, we fought against Russia together in 1992. Uh, we both beat the, the, I beat the guy that was number two in the world. Mm. He beat the guy that was number one in the world at the time. And uh, we were reminiscing on the old days. And, you know, when you have those conversations, you, you, you kind of yeah, want to yeah. come back. Yeah. Um, and I consider my, even though I'm 48, I consider myself fresh because I haven't been hit mm -hmm. all those years. So every once in a while, you think you want to make a comeback. But no, I won't be foolish. Um, you know, I enjoy working out. Uh, mm -hmm. Boxing is is one of the greatest workouts you can mm -hmm. ever do. It really works the core, works the whole body. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get in really good shape. So I used to own a fitness uh, franchise called Nine Round. Okay. So it was a combination of boxing, kickboxing, sure. cardio. and uh, But I sold that about four years ago. But okay. that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I still, I, I haven't gone there in a while, but part of when I sold it, I, I could have an infinite membership sure. uh, in Oak Creek. So it's been a while since I've gone. But... You know, I, I try to talk to the kids when my coach Shorty invites mm -hmm. me and encourage them. I'm on the U.S. Olympic Boxing Board. I'm okay. on the I'm a, the vice president, so it's a great way to give back to a sport that helped create the person that I am today, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully provide inspiration to these kids that um, not all of them have to turn professional. It it is an avenue, and for some, it's very lucrative. But you can learn so much in boxing yes. that could pivot you to success in another area the way it did for me. And so I want to uh, continue to be that voice for them as well. Good. What do you think about the uh, MMA? You know, when I was uh, I worked under Governor Doyle, mm -hmm. I w used to be the commissioner of boxing and mixed martial arts for the state okay. of Wisconsin. And I brought in uh, UFC. Uh, to re Well, they actually wanted to come to Wisconsin but they won't come to a state unless there's rules and regulations. So while I was there, we created the rules and regulations for, for mixed martial arts. Um, and that has brought in millions of revenue uh, to the state since they've been mm -hmm. here a few times now. MMA, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> uh, boxing is much more of a science in my mm -hmm. opinion. In my opinion. Strategy, absolutely. Strategy. Um, it's also much more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Contrary to what, what, what it looks like, mm -hmm. MMA looks very brutal. Mm -hmm. The punches are much more localized, mm -hmm. but the training that you go through in boxing, mm -hmm. the sparring, mm -hmm. the, the potential injury to the brain is much worse sure. than MMA. And so um, I, I'm more of a fan of boxing, mm -hmm. uh, even though I, I, I realize it's a dangerous sport, mm -hmm. but both of them are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Tyson, making a comeback, what do you think? Oh, man, um, I don't think he should do it, but he's probably thinking, hey, I'm going to make a quick million. Why shouldn't I? Uh, and Roy Jones, too. I think Roy Jones is kind of backing up down a little bit. It sounds like he has some health issues that now he's talking about. But I don't know. If they make a million, they'll probably be like, let's do it. Um, you know, these guys are 50 years old, mm -hmm. man. You know, they don't, they don't, they're not the... Uh, you know, they don't have the athletic prowess they used to have when they were, you know, 20 and uh, 20 mm -hmm. years old. But uh, it's kind of sad because a lot of these guys are broke. Right. And that's why they continue to box. It's really sad in boxing. One of the things I would like to do, actually, is um, work with Congress okay. and actually the president on uh, making sure that there are pensions for boxers, just like there is in the NBA and in baseball and other professional sports because these boxers, you know, some of them are, uh, make millions of dollars mm -hmm. and then they retire broke. Mm -hmm. And then they got to continue to fight and they, they continue to get hurt yep. even worse. It's really sad. So is that really um, the responsibility then of Congress or the president to kind of move that in direction to a system get a pension? Or does that mean that there is just this underbelly of deceit, corruption with handlers or something else that take advantage of people. Yeah, I doubt the promoters will develop associations say we should do this. So yeah, it will have to uh, be an act of Congress uh, for something like that. Because Don King has got to be one of the most gifting people there. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. These guys, man, they I mean, I, I guess there's some good guys, you know, in the sport, but most of them. It's just a tough game. Yeah. And as long as they can make some money out of you and sure. 
um, they want to make money. Right. You know, so it, it's it's kind of sad the way the business is. But yeah, this would take an act of Congress to kind of intervene and, and say this is the right thing to do. And just let's be in parity with sure. some of the other major sports. Yep. You know, it's 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 the right thing. It's the smart thing to do. Too. Hard not to agree with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hector, this has been a real delight. Yeah. Um, if you got a moment longer, we can talk about your favorite food. Okay. So uh, you got to buy my book, My Journey from Boxing Ring to You got to autograph it for me. Five Virtues for Life and Leadership. So, so you'll see in the book, okay. um, Giesel okay. is my favorite food. And, and my mother made it to perfection. And Giesel is like, uh, it's like a Puerto Rican beef stew okay. with different, uh, there's plantains and, and different um, um, chayote, and okay. calabaza, and and batata, different type of Puerto Rican potatoes. and Beef, it, pork, goat. Oh, it's it's the best food in the world. I'll make it for you. Uh, you, you, you know how to make it? No, but yeah. I will. I'll make it for you. Yeah, yeah. And you'll right. come and tell me what it's like. Okay, sounds good. That's good. Yeah. Unless you want to come in and show me. All right. I, I will. I can show you one day. There's a cooking segment. Good. I, I cook very well. My wife uh, cooks very well. My mom taught us, so uh -huh. she, she's oh. the, she's the, the, the best. Cook. So that's actually my, my favorite. Patrick, cooking segment, yes? Perfect. <laughs> yes. Good. And uh, aside from your, your mom cooking, of course, where do you like to go to eat? Anywhere in the world that you've been, what's your best, your all-time best restaurant meal? You know, I, I like steak, uh, so carnivore uh, is always good. But I, I'm pretty, I like Chinese, I like Italian. I like I like it all. Um, Puerto Rican's my favorite, I gotta say. Um, uh, you know, but but I'm I'm not very picky. I I, I like all foods <laughs> from all different cultures. Okay. Yeah. Do you go back to Puerto Rico often? I do. Uh, so my father lives in Puerto Rico. Has been there since I was 12 years old, and uh, he uh, yeah. So he's there. It was right after the the last hurricane. Mm -hmm. I went immediately after that and okay. saw the island just yeah. destroyed. But I haven't been back since. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a couple of years now in the pandemic. So I don't, I don't know when I'll be out there again. My father's about 80 years old, and and um, and uh, I'd like to get out there soon, hopefully. What happened to Arecibo? Arecibo. Um, so uh, something happened there just recently, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I it's, actually go ahead, please. Yeah, I no, no. I just heard, but I don't know the details though. Yeah. Do you? I I don't. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. But it looks like. Part of the dish has collapsed or yeah, something, yeah. you know, major had to destroy that because I've, I've, I've been there. It's just a gorgeous facility and yep. it really looks like uh, the aliens, quite frankly, built that because you can't get heavy equipment to drive through that jungle to get to there. Yeah. I can never figure out from an engineering standpoint how they did that. Wow. And it wasn't airdropped in, but something has happened to, to Arecibo. It's terrible. I, I just heard something today, and I didn't read the article just yet. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So you've been to Puerto Rico. I've been to Puerto Rico. Yes, Puerto yeah. Rico. Beautiful. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. El Coqui. Mm -hmm. Yes. Help you go to sleep at night or, or keep <laughs> you up at night, depending. Depending on what you're doing, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hector, this has been a real pleasure, and uh, I'm honored that you came by. You, I know how incredibly busy you are. So Thank you. I look forward to a cooking segment with you and my friend. Oh, that'd be great. So, that'd be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to uh, watch another of these interesting little programs we're doing. Yes. Uh, any questions, by all means, please blast us an email or send us a call. And uh, cheers. Cheers.